I'm Dr. Stephen Bramer, and this is our study in the prophet Jeremiah. If you've got your Bibles, open them up, and let's get ready to study as we take a look at this wonderful, wonderful uh, prophet, sometimes called the weeping prophet because of his great lament uh, in uh, so many cases. Let me just go back there. Last uh, lesson, we took a look at Jeremiah 30 to 33. It's often called the book of comfort or consolation. And in this section of Jeremiah, we were introduced to a wonderful, wonderful term, the new covenant. Uh, spoken of in other prophetic books as well, uh, this new arrangement that God will have with his people in the future, which includes the giving of the spirit. But the other prophets never call it by this particular term, new covenant. This will be the term by which this covenant will be referred to in the New Testament as well. It will describe in this covenant how God will bring his people back to the land, that there in the land he will enter into a new agreement with them, which will provide for them fulfillment of both the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants. This was a tremendous a message of hope that the people uh, during the time of Jeremiah uh, would have welcomed. And yet we realize that this is future since Jeremiah has spent so much time talking to them about the sins that they have committed. Jeremiah is a covenant enforcement mediator. He comes on behalf of God as God's mediator to enforce the covenant, the Mosaic covenant. And he calls out the people in how they have broken the law, what we would call um, uh, uh, being penalized. Uh, he has talked to them about the curses, the judgments that have already come upon them because of breaking the law, and the judgments that will come upon them, including the exile. When we come to this class today, we're going to cover a number of chapters, Jeremiah 34 to 45. Uh, this section will have a number of historical fulfillments, a number of things that will happen in the time of Jeremiah. Uh, we'll refer to some things in the future, but it's like he's moved back from talking about these future activities of the new covenant and then has reversed back to the historical situation uh, that the people of Judah find themselves in. Chapter 34 Jeremiah comes to King Zedekiah. King Zedekiah is the last king of the nation of Judah, and he and Jeremiah have a really mixed relationship. Jeremiah comes to Zedekiah and promises him, by the word of the Lord, that he would not die in the siege there in Jerusalem. He would live in peace, but it would be in Babylon, and he would be properly mourned there when he did die. This mercy, uh, th this act of grace, which I was not expecting, I'm not sure that you were expecting that this king who had opposed Jeremiah would somehow receive um, uh, a postponement of uh, judgment in the sense that he'd only be put on probation. He would not die at the time. He would get to go to Babylon. And although there in Babylon, he would not be king. Uh, at least he would still be alive. I think the only way that I can understand this uh, promise of God to King Zedekiah would be to see it as an act of mercy to him because of the promises that God had made to King David. Uh, as Zed Zedekiah is a descendant of King David, um, God is uh, perhaps showing faithfulness, uh, showing uh, mercy, showing grace towards this descendant, although he did not have a heart after God like David did. Nevertheless, to tell the people, uh, this Davidic kingship is the one that I will use. Later on, uh, we will have the account, uh, both in Kings and later on in Jeremiah, in chapter 52 of his capture. He, he, although he was told he would not be killed in uh, Jerusalem, he tried to escape. He was uh, captured as he went uh, down towards Jericho and was later on brought before King Nebuchadnezzar. Perhaps because of the preaching of Jeremiah, perhaps recognizing that uh, Jeremiah 
uh, was indicating that there was some mercy available to God, perhaps because they were trying to uh, get away from, to avoid the previously stated judgment that the vast majority of them who stayed there in Jerusalem would be killed, they decided to appease God. They decided perhaps even to appease Jeremiah. They had obtained slaves, but these were Jewish slaves. And in the law in Deuteronomy, it was clear that they were not to put their fellow uh, members of the nation, their, their distant family members, into slavery. If a Jewish person needed money, then he was uh, allowed to sell his property uh, until uh, he could claim it back. If he didn't have any property to sell, uh, the Jewish people were supposed to lend. They were supposed to enable them to, in some way, carry on. If they had to come and work for a person, uh, because they had no money at all to care for their family, they were still not to be treated as slaves. But they had broken this law. And now, for whatever reason, they decide to release their slaves. However, <laughs> you can see that they're doing it because they are scared to death of the Babylonians. Not necessarily scared and not having a fear of God. And so when the Babylonians withdrew for a period, and it looked like Jeremiah's words would not come true, that they didn't have to uh, somehow appease God uh, before the judgment came, uh, then the king, and um, despite of uh, uh, Jeremiah telling the king that he wouldn't die, the king and his people reneged. And they um, uh, took back these slaves that they had released, and made them slaves once again. They did not keep their oath. And so through Jeremiah, God comes and responds to these covenant-breaking people with another stern rebuke. He first of all reminds them that they were once slaves in Egypt, and God had released them. They were no longer slaves. They had obtained freedom, not because of anything that they had done, but because of God's great mercy. And God, therefore, desired to have these slaves released, but they were not doing what God had required of them, neither from the law of God nor from their past experience as a nation. And so, therefore, he declares his judgment on them. Almost all of them will die except for King Zedekiah. He will, of course, um, uh, be captured. He will have his eyes removed. And just before he is blinded, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar kills his sons in front of his very eyes. So he spends the rest of his life in prison, in Babylon. Uh, he, Jeremiah said you could live in peace, but because of this further uh, sin on his behalf, I think he is going to live thinking of the death of his children for the rest of his life. In contrast to these Jewish people who did not keep their word, um, an example is given of the Rechabites. These are non-Israelites, and they have come to live in the land for various reasons that you can read, but they had a consistency. This narrative that is now recorded actually occurred uh, a decade earlier. It recur occurred during the reign of Jehoiakim, and we're now in the reign of King Zedekiah. And it's put here to contrast between the faithfulness of a group of people who kept their word and these Israelites from Judah who did not keep their word, that is, to release their slaves. Jeremiah comes to these people called the Rechabites who are living there in Jerusalem, and uh, he offers wine to them. I think Jeremiah knew exactly what he was doing. He was testing them because we'll see in just a bit that they had agreed uh, to abide by the vow that their father had taken not to drink wine. And so when Jeremiah offers them wine, it is refused. Uh, their refusal was so that they could be faithful to the commitment that their father had made not to drink wine or to build a permanent house, although the reason for him taking this vow is not revealed. Some people think it may be a Nazarite vow from uh, Judges uh, chapter 6, um, uh, sorry, from uh, 
uh, yeah, uh, Joshua chapter six, sorry, Joshua chapter six, uh, but it's not revealed. He made a vow and he asked his descendants to keep this vow. And uh, these descendants of his uh, kept the vow. They would not go against the word uh, that they had promised. And so Jeremiah uses the faithfulness of these uh, Rechabites to show uh, the contrast between them and um, the, let me just stop here for a moment. I need to turn this off, uh, not now, please. Um, Uh, sorry, I had to uh, uh, take care of something in my screen. Hopefully that we'll be able to perhaps uh, edit that portion out. If not, uh, don't worry about it. I just had a, an app uh, pop up. I'm not sure if you could see it or not asking me to renew and to move to another version. Jeremiah contrasts a faithfulness with unfaithfulness. While Judah will experience disaster, as Jeremiah has prophesied, the Rechabites who have kept their word are promised a continuing line that will stand before the Lord. Now, what exactly he meant by stand, we're not sure, but apparently they will have a person, since they were living there in Jerusalem, uh, to appear before the Lord, to uh, seek the Lord's blessing, uh, perhaps later on to even offer sacrifices. Although they were non-Israelites, they may have become proselytes where they recognized the true God and obeyed him, although culturally and ethnically uh, they were not uh, Jewish people. So they're promised um, a blessing, whereas uh, the people of Judah are promised uh, judgment because they did not keep their word. Jeremiah in chapter 36 has his scroll burnt. In a time when Jeremiah was imprisoned jo during Jehoiakim's reign, uh, this is again uh, earlier, 10 years or so earlier than uh, we originally had it with King Zedekiah. As you know, in Jeremiah, he goes back and forth between various kings. His prophecy is not given in complete chronological order, but rather he deals with certain themes. And now we're dealing with the theme here in chapters 36 to 38 with uh, Jeremiah um, uh, being persecuted. And so uh, he is in prison. He dictates his message. He sends it by means of his um, amanuensis, his, his uh, transcriber, uh, Barak, um, uh, to the king. But when the king receives it, when he reads it to, first of all, to the king's officials, and then uh, the king wanted to hear about it, so it was read, as the word of God through Jeremiah is being read, rather than being concerned, he tends to cut off the scroll, perhaps as each part of the scroll is read, uh, he takes a knife and he cuts it off, and he throws it into a fire. He does not believe that this Word of God has any authority, any power. He, he maybe is curious, but he does not want anybody else to have access to it and somehow think it might be true. And so he has it burnt in the fire. It's a total rejection of God's word by the highest official in the kingdom of God on earth at that time, the kingdom of Judah. He shows absolute rejection of what God has said. Perhaps, although it's not stated in the context, we're to see a contrast here between good King Josiah when they discovered the word of God in the temple and when King Josiah heard about that, rather than dismissing it, he, he not only reads it, but he then begins to enforce it throughout his kingdom. He believes that this word has authority, that this word is to be obeyed. And this word is even above any authority or words that he would have. This is the word of God. So there seems to be a contrast, at least an unstated contrast here. Now, Jeremiah is commanded by the Lord to rewrite his destroyed message and to add to it a message of condemnation for the king. Can you imagine 
having to rewrite by hand uh, a series of messages that you have written. Uh, this was costly to get uh, a manuscript, uh, a thin piece of leather, uh, to have it uh, dictated and recorded. I remember the time many, many years ago when I was first married and I was living in the city of Toronto in Canada, uh, seeing an ad in the newspaper. And the ad uh, had to do with a briefcase that a person had left on a subway car. And it went on to describe that in that briefcase were two copies of his dissertation that he was turning into the University of Toronto. He was giving a reward and the reward was just for one copy of his dissertation. He welcomed the person to keep his briefcase and the second copy. He just needed the one copy. And if you think, well, why was that so important? This was before there were computers. And so without a computer, you had to type every word on a typewriter. You could make two copies by putting a piece of, of carbon paper, um, even in our computers today, we'll sometimes click on CC, carbon copy. It means a, a second copy that was made by the carbon. And so he had typed out his dissertation, hundreds of pages with these two copies. And now he had lost, I, I don't know how he felt when he lost that dissertation, when he somehow left his briefcase on the subway. Oh, I'm sure that if he went home, he would have bits and pieces and some uh, notes that he had made. But, but to rewrite the whole thing would have just been almost beyond belief. I remember when I was doing my dissertation, by then we had uh, computers, but we didn't have the big hard drives that we have in our computers today. We used to have these little uh, disks that we put in. Uh, your computer could only take about uh, 40 megabytes or something. And if you want something a little larger, then you had to put it on the various disks. And each day at the end of working down in the library at Dallas Theological Seminary, I would um, make a couple of disks. I would leave one there in my carol in the DTS library. I would uh, take one with me and leave it in the car, and I would take another with me and leave it at home. So I made sure that if my car burnt when I had the two copies in it, or if the library burnt down, or, or my house burnt down, that I would always have another copy. I was petrified uh, of losing a copy of my dissertation. This is the Word of God. And Jeremiah has to rewrite all of this. Uh, between the Septuagint and the Hebrew text, we often have a difference between uh, the various uh, 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 texts that we have of Jeremiah. And it may partly be because um, some parts were kept and then other parts were rewritten, and perhaps it's not put in this chronological order, but the person then puts it in some sort of thematic order as they collect. Could I just remind you of a very, very important point and application, not only from this passage, but from the entire Word of God. God's Word is not to be destroyed. It's not to be ignored. The book of Revelation says you're not supposed to take anything away. You're not supposed to add anything to it. Specifically, of course, talking about the prophetic material of the book of Revelation so that people who are going through the tribulation would not have anything left out. People wouldn't have added to it. And therefore, they're saying, well, well then this is not coming true. Can we believe? Uh, John wanted just the word that God had given to be preserved. And of course, since all of the word of God is the Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is absolutely true and without error, uh, we ought not to add to it. We ought not to take away from it. And certainly, we should never ignore it or destroy it. Two things are going to last. Uh, people are going to last for all eternity. And the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God, will never, ever pass away. It will be fulfilled and will remain forever. In chapter 37, Jeremiah is imprisoned. Uh, Zedekiah uh, kind of falsely repents. Uh, he, he has heard, he, he's trying to hedge his bets. He's trying to make sure that he doesn't offend Nebuchadnezzar too badly, that he'll be destroyed, but he doesn't want to uh, uh, be on Jeremiah's side either. And Zedekiah, when he became king, so we've now moved back uh, a little bit from uh, the previous message we have of Zedekiah. We've moved forward from 
Jehoiakim's time, when he became king, Zedekiah, he sent some envoys to Jeremiah and he said, please pray for us to the Lord our God. Well, of course, the king should have prayed himself. If he really believed that God was real, then he should have gone to the priests in the temple. He should have offered his sacrifices. I think what he's doing here is trying to manipulate the prophet. He he is um, got a, a repentance, uh, but it's false. It, it doesn't seem to be true because of what follows. Because the Babylonians have pulled back, um, Zedekiah, I think, is hoping that now, Jeremiah, if he would talk to the Lord, would come up with a different message. But uh, God's message is going to be true. Uh, the only way God's message would change is if King Zedekiah and the people truly repented. Jeremiah's response to this apparent um, false repentance, uh, this manipulation on the part of King Zedekiah, is to declare that the Babylonians would be returning and they would capture Jerusalem. Now, you may see uh, that the people who were coming were actually called the Chaldeans. And I put, that is the Babylonians. The term Chaldean is used a number of times in the Old Testament. It's used as a synonym for Babylonians. Chaldean actually refers to the ethnicity of the people. They're originally a kind of semi-nomadic tribe that lived down in that southern part of Mesopotamia, the land of the two rivers, uh, down near a city called Babylon. And later on, uh, they occupied uh, the city and the area around the city, and therefore they became known as Babylonians. Um, if an ethnic person from India was to move to the United States of America. Ethnically, they would be Indian, uh, but from um, uh, perhaps a citizenship, uh, they would be called Americans. And uh, sometimes I'll go to people who have a different skin tone or have an accent, and I'll say, uh, now what country are you from? And they'll say, well, America. I, I was born here. And I think they know what I'm doing because they usually have a little smile on their face and say, well, where did your parents or grandparents come from? And they will tell me uh, the nation. But they're proud to be a citizen of the state. And these people who had ethn an ethnicity in some uh, nomadic tribe, uh, probably an Arab nomadic tribe, uh, had uh, moved in, become domesticated, and took upon themselves the name of the Babylonian, uh, Babylon, so they became known as Babylonians. So when you read in scripture Chaldeans or Babylonians, you can really treat them as um, uh, synonyms. As a result of Jeremiah refusing to change his message, King Zedekiah had said, you go and pray to your God. Maybe your God made a mistake. Maybe you were too overzealous. You said the Babylonians were coming. It looks like they're withdrawn. But Jeremiah comes back and says, no, no. God's word is true. And because he refuses to give a more positive message to the king, he has him arrested. He has him actually put in a dungeon at a man called Jonathan, um, up in Anathoth, and, and he puts him in a, a dungeon and uh, wants to kill him. And perhaps he would have been killed if he had been left there. He might have starved to death. And with um, a message that goes to King uh, Zedekiah, uh, Jeremiah is uh, released from that dungeon and he's moved into the courtyard of the guard. You can see that the relationship that Zedekiah and Jeremiah had was a really mixed relationship. King Zedekiah doesn't seem to want him to die, but uh, he doesn't seem to want him to be free to spread his message either. Jeremiah in chapter 38 reminds the king and the people that the only way to live through this judgment that coming is to defect, to submit to the Babylonians. He doesn't say it in so many words, but he's saying, pack your suitcases. Uh, Get your backpack, uh, put in what you need, and uh, walk out the gates of Jerusalem, and uh, start even walking uh, down the, the highway towards Babylon. And when the Babylonian army comes, they say, uh, where are you going? Are you trying to escape? They say, no, no, we're going to Babylon. That's the only way to live, because God has said the Babylonians will come, and those who are left there in Jerusalem will be destroyed. 
We'll later on find out that only a few remained and whether they were actually in the city of Jerusalem since the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and burnt. They, they might have been having escaped or there were people living in the outskirts of Jerusalem in some of the hill country round about it. But uh, Jeremiah's word will come true. The people of Jerusalem will be killed. Jeremiah tells the people, go out. <laughs> By this means, they'll continue to live. The exile it is not something that should be a surprise. Them. It's based upon Deuteronomy 28, verses 63 and 64. So for anybody to say to Jeremiah, you cannot prophesy about exile. God has given us this land, this land flowing with milk and honey, even though it's not flowing with much milk or much honey right now. Uh, Jeremiah would say no. God did say that, but he said it in the context of you obeying him. When Joshua came into the land, he obeyed the word of the Lord that had come through Moses. In the book of Joshua, there might only be three places where there seems to be a, a measure of disobedience. Um, when um, uh, a man from the uh, nation of Israel decided to, to take some of the goods from Jericho and to hide them. Um, uh, that was a bad instant. Uh, when they did not, uh, when uh, Joshua did not consult the Lord on whether these people who said they came from a far distance were really people of the land, uh, the Gibeonites were. Uh, they seem to, uh, Joshua seems to have uh, just in a few cases uh, not um, been as thorough as he should have been. Uh, when the Gibeonites um, are found out to be liars, he maintains the covenant that he made with them over uh, his covenant that he has made with the Lord God. Nevertheless, uh, the book of Joshua is a book of success. Why? Because the people obeyed the word of God. But God always reserved the right in this conditional covenant of uh, made at Sinai, the Mosaic covenant, uh, to send them into exile if they did not obey. Because of Jeremiah's prophecy, he's thrown into muddy cistern. Now, a cistern is, is a below ground water holding reservoir. There is no water that comes into it from the bottom or from the sides. In fact, cisterns are usually dug down into the limestone that is found throughout uh, the land of Israel. Uh, some limestone is hard, sometimes is softer. Uh, they would dig whatever limestone they have, but in order to prevent the water from seeping into the limestone, limestone is like a sponge and will absorb the water, they would take a plaster, a waterproof plaster, and they would plaster the sides of it. Um, the way you would get water in is to divert water in some sort of aqueduct, some sort of ancient pipe system to bring the water. Uh, sometimes they would direct the water from the roofs of houses down into a cistern. It wouldn't have been great water to drink, uh, but it would have been water that you could use. And uh, they even perfected putting little, um, uh, I'm not sure what they're called, little snails and things like that into the water that would take care of some of the algae so that it, it didn't become really, really stagnant. He's thrown into a cistern. Uh, most of the water is gone, but there in the bottom is a little bit of water. And uh, the water that has come in from the roofs of the houses and flowing along the street, of course, has had some mud in it. And now he is standing, probably not sitting, but if he has to sit or lie down in this muddy cistern. They, the king's officials want to kill him. And for some reason, I guess they're waiting for the opportune time, they throw him into this reservoir. However, a non-Israelite, isn't it interesting to see these non-Israelites in the book of Jeremiah who uh, are the ones who, who listen to the word of God, uh, who, who honor Jeremiah, who's bringing the word. This Ethiopian eunuch, he's a servant of the king. He, he defied the other officials of the king, and he pleaded for Jeremiah in the very presence of the king. I think he realized if Jeremiah is left there, at some point in time, the officials will be dragging him out of that cistern and will kill him. And so Jeremiah receives a partial deliverance. He's not declared innocent. He's not set free, uh, but he's brought out of the cistern and uh, is uh, still held uh, by the king's uh, officials. 
It's by the means of the mercy of a non-Israelite, while his own people exhibited no mercy at all. If you ever go over to the land of Israel and you walk south out of the present old city walls, 500 years old, built by um, the Ottoman Turks, and you walk out the Dung Gate and you begin to walk down uh, the road toward the Pool of Siloam, on the left-hand side, you'll see a wonderful entrance to the city of David. A nice gold harp there uh, is designed in the entrance way. Some harp music is playing. And usually you go in and you go straight in and you, you're going to look over into the Kidron Valley and you're going to go down underneath and see the huge stones from some monumental building, perhaps the Palace of David. But, but before you go too far, just look to the left and go into a little courtyard there that's got some grapevines growing and uh, some, some poles over top of it. And, and there you will see a grate. And if you look down in that grate, you will see a cistern. We are not sure that it is the cistern that Jeremiah was put in. Nevertheless, it's a cistern in the city of David. And if you look down there, you might need a flashlight to realize just how deep those go. I've seen a little bit of water in those as some of the water from this courtyard has come into it. But it's great to see uh, cisterns. Uh, the cisterns are found throughout Israel because it only rains for approximately six months. And therefore, you need to have some way of keeping water unless you live in a place where you can dig a well and receive fresh water. The third rejection of Jeremiah is going to incur in this section. Uh, we've already had one in chapter 37. We had one at the beginning of chapter 38. King Zedekiah privately inquires of Jeremiah. Hey, hey, Jeremiah, have you changed your mind? He doesn't want the people to hear, but he wants to know if there's any change. But Jeremiah again repeats his message. The only way to safety is to submit. The fall itself comes in chapter 39. So in this section between 39 and, and 45, we have the fall of Jerusalem and uh, some of the aftermath, the historical message. Now, chapter 39 will be repeated again in, in a fashion in chapter 52. Here in chapter 39, after a two-year siege of Jerusalem, uh, the walls, the gates of Jerusalem were breached, and the Babylonians became commanders of the city. Jerusalem would be later completely burnt. When they first broke in, they didn't completely burn anything. Uh, but they did take the utensils out of the temple. A and ultimately, because of rebellion, they uh, put to death people in it. Uh, King Zedekiah escaped. Uh, in the north part of the old city today, there's a place called Zedekiah's Cave. It goes way back underneath the uh, Muslim quarter of the city. It's actually a quarry. It's not a, a natural cave. But because it goes in so long, there were people... Uh, in the past who said that cave goes all the way down to Jericho and that's the way Zedekiah escaped. <laughs> well, that's just not true. I've been into all of the reaches of that cave. It's not true. Uh, but the king somehow escaped past, perhaps through some sort of, of tunnel, some sort of water passageway, perhaps uh, in the middle of the night when uh, Zedekiah or his commanders, his armies, I didn't notice. Uh, but he's captured and he is put to death. In contrast to King Zedekiah, Jeremiah is not deport, deported. He's actually put into change and, and uh, was about to be taken away when um, the oppressors realized, oh, this is the man that we've heard about. He has been preaching for many, many years, and we've heard that he has been preaching to people, just submit to the Babylonians. And therefore, uh, when they find out who he is, uh, they graciously set him fee, uh, free, and they deal with him in a very uh, gracious way. Once again, non-Israelites treating Jeremiah with grace and mercy, rather than God's people, who should have known better, who treated uh, Jeremiah in a very, very um, uh, harsh manner. Jeremiah was given into the protection of a man called Gedaliah. No longer is there a king, but there is this man who becomes a governor. He would be responsible for um, taking the taxes from this area and sending them to Babylon, making sure that there was no insurrection. 
And so Jeremiah is put under his authority and allowed to return home to Anathoth in Benjamin, three miles uh, north, northeast of Jerusalem. It's member in Anathoth that Jeremiah has bought that piece of land. This is where his father, the priest, had lived. And now Jerusalem is ruined. There's no need really for Jeremiah to be a prophet, a covenant enforcer to the king and to the officials. And so he returns home. But Jeremiah did not forget the mercy of that Ethiopian, Ebed Melech, uh, meaning Ebed means servant, Melech is king, servant of the king, who had rescued him earlier. Uh, he gives to this man a prophecy that God would deliver him because in rescuing Jeremiah, he had earlier on indicated that he was trusting God. And God recognized that and said, because you delivered Jeremiah on the basis that you trusted me, uh, you will be delivered. You will not suffer the same destruction as so many of the other people of Judah. There was a small group still alive uh, from some of the surrounding towns. Perhaps some of them had escaped into caves and cisterns. Uh, perhaps some of them had uh, in some way um, served the Babylonians, even as they were gathered around uh, Jerusalem. We're not sure, but there was a small number who were not taken into exile. And in chapter 40 and 41, their experiences are related. Um, Jeremiah uh, is uh, allowed to live. Uh, we've seen that. He's under Gedaliah. And then in chapter 41, Gedaliah is murdered. Now, as the governor, uh, not everybody would have liked the fact that he was working on behalf of the Babylonians. But a lot of people around him realize that this Gedaliah can protect us, that, that he will not turn against us, that he will be gracious. And therefore, when they heard of a coup attempt, someone was coming to assassinate Gedaliah, they warned him. But Gedaliah did not believe them. For whatever reason, uh, he didn't think that this could happen. Perhaps he thought no one is going to offend the Babylonians. If you kill me, you're going to offend the Babylonians and, and they will come and destroy you. Surely you won't do that. But a group of people did come and they did murder Gedaliah. And, and the people who came and realized that Gedaliah had been murdered, they went after them and, and they killed a number of them and they brought some people back and now they realize they're in trouble. Although they had avenged the murder, the assassination of Gedaliah, that doesn't mean that the Babylonians will necessarily take it easy on them. And so they decide they've got to get out of town. And so they want to migrate to Egypt. Now, remember way back in chapter one, when Jeremiah is called to be uh, a servant of the Lord, he has that indication that the destruction will come from the north, the Babylonians will come. But he is also warned and has warned the people in his book, do not go back to Egypt. Egypt is not your place of safety. God had brought them out of Egypt. He said, you are no longer to see them as your means of redemption. Rather, you're to submit to Babylon. And so he continues to instruct these people. But they go to him and they, they want him to say it's okay to Egypt. Why? Because they've already decided to go there. If you read it carefully, they're really wanting Jeremiah's stamp of approval. They have made their decision. That can happen to people today. I've had students come to me and say, um, uh, God wants me to do this or that, marry this person, that person, whatever. And they say, what do you think about it? And I always say to them, don't ask me to give an opinion and defiance of what you believe is the word of God. And they say, well, I'm not really sure that God has told me. I'm saying, well, listen, you've told me that God has told you to do this. I think you're wanting me to agree with your personal discernment, with, with your imagination. But, but you know that there might be something there that would cause you to hesitate. You realize that maybe the person that you're intending to marry is not a believer, is not a believer following the Lord. Perhaps you're realizing that you're going to do something out of the wrong motives. And so I always say to them, now, if I was able to give you instructions that would be from the Lord, would you be willing to follow those instructions? There's often a hesitation. They kind of want an opinion, and they like to put all these opinions together and then them make the decision. 
God doesn't work that way. When you discern the Lord's will, then obedience is required. You may not even understand. Understanding is optional. Obedience is required. But in order to make sure that God somehow will go with them, they take Jeremiah along. Remember that temple sermon back there in chapter 7 through 10, where they treated the temple as a good luck charm, saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Now they're saying, Jeremiah the prophet, Jeremiah the prophet. If we've got him, we'll be okay. They go down to Egypt, and we have an eighth symbolic act. Jeremiah is told to take some large stones and to bring the Jewish people along with him and to bury them in the courtyard outside of the palace of the Pharaoh. So no doubt there were a number of large flat stones there in a pavement area, and Jeremiah digs up some and puts in these ones that he has brought there, and then he says to the people, on these very stones, the king of Babylon will put his throne and will judge Egypt. You brought me down here thinking that you would escape the judgment of the Babylonians. I'm telling you, the Babylonians are coming right here. Why will you not find God's protection in Egypt? Not only did he tell you not to go down there, but you are idolatrous people. You are committing idolatry, especially the women. Uh, those who have fled to Egypt are committing idolatry. They're ignoring their history. They're ignoring the words of God through Moses. They're ignoring the words of the prophet. And therefore, God says, the Jews in Egypt will be decimated. He says, none of the remnant of Judah who have come to live in the land of Egypt shall escape or survive or return to the land of Judah, to which they desire to return to dwell there. They will not return except for some fugitives. You can't count on going back. Now, the word remnant is used here. In other places, remnant will be a good thing. It will be the godly people in Babylon who will come back as a worshiping remnant. But a remnant just means a small group of people. And this remnant who have gone to Egypt, they have become idolaters. They're worshiping the queen of heaven. Probably this refers to Ishtar, the goddess of fertility. And uh, this goddess of fertility was... Uh, found back in the worship of Baal. Uh, it's found in the worship of a number of ancient Near East um, nations. And in fact, in many times, even today, people have both a male and female, uh, a god and a goddess. And usually in that, there is sexual immorality because there is a sensuality even among their gods. But they are sinning with a high hand. They are sinning deliberately, and therefore God judges them. The Egyptians won't escape either. Jeremiah said that king of Babylon will come and set up his throne here. And Pharaoh Hophra, uh, who is ruling at this time, will end up experiencing a similar fate to Z King Zedekiah. Babylon was God's instrument of punishment, just as later God will use Persia to punish Babylon. Chapter 45 the amanuensis, the secretary, the, the uh, transcriber, Baruch, uh, who has served Jeremiah, no doubt for decades, <laughs> um, experienced many of the persecutions, maybe not down in the dungeon, in the cisterns with Jeremiah, but, but not being treated with, with any respect. He's gone down with Jeremiah, and now he reaches the end of his patience. He probably has learned from Jeremiah. You know those complaints that we've had throughout the book of Jeremiah, where, where Jeremiah is just completely honest with God. He's frustrated. He doesn't believe that God's doing the right thing. Why is he being faithful to God when God won't change anybody's mind? And now Baruch um, says, um, I've had it. And, and God gives a personal message uh, to his uh, servant. It, it was from before, it, it's now said here, because he's down there in Egypt, and it, it's again a message because Baruch now is acting the same way. It involves a rebuke as well as hope. He's rebuked because he feels that God is unjust, unsympathetic. You said, woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. <laughs> Notice, me and my. Uh, he says, 
God, look what's happening with me. You must be unjust. You can understand how Job uh, must have felt when he has done nothing wrong and yet is experiencing uh, judgment um, that he believes comes from God because he says God's sovereign, even from uh, my enemies. That ultimately, God is the one who's allowing this to be brought. Well, Baruch uh, doesn't feel that God is treating him fairly. He's warned, however, not to focus on his personal success or ease. Don't you seek great things for yourself, but rather allow God to do what he needs to do for his people. Good little lesson here for us. Sometimes we grumble and complain and think we're having a hard time. Look at the sacrifice I'm making. Think of the sacrifice that Jesus made. Think of the hope that God has given to you and me. And sometimes we take our eye off of, of what God is doing, even what other godly people are going through, and we say, oh, poor me. Remember one time I came into the kitchen when I was living at home, and my younger sister was underneath the kitchen table looking rather grumpy. And I said, Martha, I said, what are you doing there? She said, I'm pouting. I said, why are you pouting? She said, because mother won't do uh, for me what I want her to do. And I said, are you okay? And she said, no, because mother won't come into the kitchen to see me pouting. <laughs> she, she wanted my mother to be influenced by her. I think my mother probably knew she was in there pouting and just decided to leave her there. Uh, my mother, no doubt, had been fair, and uh, my sister just wanted her to change her mind. But God promises to this man, Baruch, that he would give him his life as a prize of war in all the place you may go. That is, wherever you go, even down here in Egypt, your life will be given to you. You will not die. What, what a tremendous hope to know that you will, your life will not be taken. There's a measure of hope and freedom that you can live in. Next lecture, we'll take a look at chapters 46 to 51. This is a section that uh, speaks about all the surrounding nations. Up to now, we have mostly had the nation of Judah spoken about, a little bit about Babylon, a little bit about Egypt, but now there is a complete section. If you remember back to our very first lecture when I was giving you uh, an analogy of the prophet's covenant enforcement mediators as the color commentator for the game that's going on, you will know that I've mentioned other teams that play in this league. These are the surrounding nations. And I mentioned that while the nation of Israel has God's name on their shirts, they're Yahweh's people, there are many other nations that are also to submit to God. Why? Because he is the creator God. And so in a very real sense, every nation is accountable to God. We'll take a look at what he says to these nations next time.